Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, speak on the bill, please. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to address the uh, part that was amended, the former Senate Bill 138. I teach history. I've taught history at Western Kentucky University for 28 years, and before that, as a graduate assistant. And I've heard from so many people, history teachers, history faculty from all over the country who are deeply concerned about this issue that suddenly came out of nowhere that seems posited on the idea that people who teach history aren't doing their jobs or doing the job in a way that does not please the Kentucky General Assembly or other General, Assem General Assemblies that just suddenly discovered the teaching of history in the last few months. And it concerns me. Again, the past, is, uh, the past is my guide. The past is complicated. And the conversation seems to turn on whether or not something is divisive or not. To talk about whether or not the past is divisive is a troubling way to think about it to me as a historian. And it, and it misses the point. The point is that we have a responsibility to teach history accurately. And I do want to point out that I have the list right here of the documents that are in 138. It's a list that has gotten better every time I've seen a draft of this. I know there was an amendment out there uh, that made this a much better list. And I teach most of these things. I teach everything from survey classes to senior level classes, and I've taught graduate classes as well. Um, who, who wouldn't think the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, makes my heart sing as a trained legal historian to see those things lifted up here. But it gets to the, the things that you do when you have to decide what to teach in a finite amount of time. I, I teach Federalist Number 10, it's a fantastic document. Um, I've occasionally taught uh, one in 51. But, but I am noticing this list omits the, the two that just about everybody teaches are Federalist 10, but also Federalist 78, uh, and, uh, Alexander Hamilton's uh, famous piece about the need for an independent judiciary. So I look at this list, I'm like, well, that's not complete, and I'm aware that this bill doesn't affect higher education, and it wouldn't stop a K-12 teacher from saying, hey, I'm gonna put Federalist 78 in here because that was one of Hamilton's important ideas. I like to talk about Hamilton and tax policy as well. Anybody who's ever listened to the Hamilton soundtrack knows that if you weren't in, interested in tax policy before, the Hamilton-Jefferson rap battle can make you very interested in it. So it's a good list. A lot of these things are good lists, but as the lady from Jefferson 32 pointed out, really, there's only one, one document by a woman are, are all women of one mind? If I were writing a curriculum, one of the things I would suggest is why don't we have pro and con on the Equal Rights Amendment, for example? You could have a great debate between Gloria Steinem and Phyllis Schlafly, two very strong women with two very different opinions. There are many women sitting in this body who owe the fact they're here to Phyllis Schlafly and the intellectual tradition that she represented. Uh, she's one of the architects of the new right. So on her behalf, why, why is she not here? Why is there only one woman here? I've taught lots of these things as compare and contrast pieces. I'm glad to see that uh, the path from Dred Scott to Plessy to Brown versus Board is here. But History does not stop in 1963 and 1964. Um, this is the lady from Jefferson 32's point in committee, and as a historian, I got to cite her correctly, or I'd have to give myself an F for plagiarizing. Um, why would you not teach, if you're going to teach Reagan's A Time for Choosing, which is a great speech, and lays out his vision from, you know, in a political speech, but why wouldn't you teach that in tandem with? what he was responding to, which was Lyndon Baines Johnson's Great Society. 
much of which we debate on this floor all the time, and it's not been doing so great in the last couple days in the Kentucky General Assembly. And history didn't stop at 1964, so why not keep going? When I was uh, in high school, we always joked that we never got past World War II, and now we have so much more to offer. And that's kind of my point. I don't know that the Kentucky General Assembly should be in the business of telling history teachers how to do their jobs. I certainly don't try to tell science teachers how to do their jobs. I'm not good enough at math. I would never, ever try to dictate anything to them because I can't even have the conversation. But teachers have a responsibility to teach history accurately. And we do that while preparing the next generation of American citizens to understand their country by understanding its past. Anybody who ever took me for a class would tell you that the first thing I put on the board at the beginning of the semester is that history is understanding how things change over time. History is the study of understanding how things change over time. It's not static. It's incredibly dynamic. And to me, patriotism is not shoving things that are complicated and painful under the rug. It's acknowledging this past, understanding that your past may look different than someone else's past. It's about creating a conversation where these opposing viewpoints can be discussed and understood, but understood accurately. And this do list does include many of my heroes. I've, I've taught just about every speech Martin Luther King Jr. ever gave. And, and I love watching my students light up when they realize that so many of the heroes that led the civil rights movement were the age that they were now, people who were college students that you can literally run a major social movement at the age of 20. That's such an exciting thing to see as a teacher. I would never want to see any of that regulated, and I would never want to see anybody in a classroom self-censor because they were afraid that they were breaking a law that was set up by a bunch of people who are not teachers or trained historians. Teaching the past accurately does give students in K through 12 so much to be proud of. And the responsibility for that should be with our teachers, not with people who are sitting in the Kentucky General Assembly. So let's do our jobs. Sometimes we agree and disagree on how well we're doing them. But let's not be in the business of dictating content to teachers. Let's let teachers do the teaching guided by the Kentucky Department of Education. Let's let them work on their content areas. And let's try really hard to give them more funding and more resources and lift them up, not giving them one more thing to worry about. Thank you. The chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 31. Thank you. Will the sponsor yield to a question? He will yield. Sponsor, it says on page four that the um, superintendent will gain control over principal hiring, appropriation, and curriculum effort consultation with the site-based decision-making council. Are we talking real consultation here, or what would that look like? Gentleman from Boone. It should absolutely be real consultation. I, I would never diminish the, we're not doing away with site-based councils. There should be an ongoing conversation repeatedly. It just goes to the actual accountability phase, but schools change and move year in, year out. Teachers move year in, year out, and sometimes administrators do. So I think that needs to be an ongoing and, and a perfect world that superintendent would be out in his or her buildings or their designee would be out in their buildings on a regular basis having these consultations with the council and or the principal. Lady from Jefferson 31. Thank you. I worry that consultation could become a just a check, a check mark. May I speak on the bill, please? Yes, you may proceed. I want to speak about Section 4, what the text that is also Senate Bill 138. 
Of these 24 documents, by my count, 23 are the voices of men and 21 are the voices of white people. There are no queer voices, no native voices, no immigrants since the 1700s, and no black women. The sponsor says, teachers can still teach other stuff, to which teachers say, yeah, we already are. It's their job to teach the full scope of history, helping students appreciate the greatness and the failings of the United States. It's an insult to say that all of a sudden they need the help of the legislature in choosing primary sources. By enshrining these 24 documents in our social studies standards at a cost of about $300,000, we give them and the limited viewpoints they represent outsized recognition. The history of racism is included here in this bill because that ism is so egregious and so foundational to our country uh, that it could not reasonably be excluded or erased. Also, some people think incorrectly that we've solved racism and ended racial prejudice and bias. So it's easy to say, look at the mistakes of the past. How horrible. Anyone with their eyes and ears open knows that systemic racism persists. Since this bill was supposedly cooked up in one legislator's mind, I propose some additions of my own. All of them are centered on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. First, on the topic of misogyny, feminism, and women's ongoing movement for equality, how about an excerpt from Shirley Chisholm's For the Equal Rights Amendment speech, Lady from Warren, delivered August 10th, 1970. She said, Discrimination against women solely on the basis of their sex is so widespread that it seems to many persons normal, natural, and right. Legal expression of prejudice on the grounds of religious or political belief has become a minor problem in our society. Prejudice on the basis of race is at least under systematic attack. There is reason for optimism that it will start to die with the present older generation. It is time we act to assure full equality of opportunity to those citizens who, although in a majority, suffer the restrictions that are commonly imposed on minorities, women. The time is clearly now to put this house on record for the fullest expression of that equality of opportunity which our founding fathers professed. They professed it, but they did not assure it to their daughters as they tried to do for their sons. The Constitution they wrote was designed to protect the rights of white male citizens. As there were no black founding fathers, there were no founding mothers, a great pity on both counts. It is not too late to complete the work they left undone. Today, here, we should start to do so. Next. Let's include something about the persistent quest for fairness from our LGBTQ citizens. As we saw with anti-trans legislation in this body last week, the struggle continues. This is from the Obergefell versus Hodges opinion from the Supreme Court issued on June 26, 2015, permitting same-sex marriage. It was written by Anthony Kennedy. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. Lastly, how about including the voice of an American whose ethnicity made them a target of their own government, a topic that will hold resonance for many of our Latino and immigrant students. This is by Yuri Kochiyama, a California-born Japanese-American who spent two years in an internment camp and had this remembrance in 1991. I was red, white, and blue when I was growing up. 
I taught Sunday school and was very, very American. But I was also very provincial. We were just kids rooting for our high school. I was 19 at the time of the evacuation. I had just finished junior college. I was looking for a job and didn't realize how different the school world was from the work world. In the school world, I never felt racism. But when you got into the work world, it was very difficult. This was 1941, just before the war. I finally did get a job at a department store. But for us back then, it was a big thing because I don't think they had ever hired an Asian in a department store before. Everything changed for me on the day Pearl Harbor was bombed. On that very day, December 7th, the FBI came and they took my father. He had just come home from the hospital the day before. For several days, we didn't know where they had taken him. Then we found out that he was taken to the federal prison at Terminal Island. Overnight, things changed for us. Each of these topics could get 24 documents of its own to better represent our America. Better yet, the legislature could leave curriculum to the professionals. Chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 41. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to speak on the bill. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, too, am going to speak on sections four through five of Senate Bill 1, which incorporates parts of Senate Bill 138, which is the classroom censorship bill that dances around the edges of being anti-critical race theory without ever mentioning critical race theory. It claims that all individuals are created equal, yet trans kids can't play sports. It maintains the erasure of black women in the listed core documents. Zero core documents are written by black women or other women of color. It amplifies and affirms two Supreme Court decisions in the list of primary documents, decisions that focus on defining slaves as personal property, Dred Scott v. Sanford, and gives a thumbs up to separate but equal Plessy v. Ferguson. I cannot imagine that this aligns with the Commission on Race and Access to Opportunity. In the words of JCPS teacher Ms. Thomas Walker, this is not the time to hide behind false history. We must take the time to educate everyone from all walks of life about the history of the United States. We need to stop teaching false history to our students. They deserve to know the truth, and it is our duty as educators to teach the truth. Those of us who support educational efforts that include racial equity, colonization, slavery, and civil rights are not interested in teaching hate. We are not interested in overthrowing the government. We are not interested in accusing anyone of being inherently racist or hateful. We are community, not enemies. We are only interested in teaching truth to our children, with all children equally represented in that truth, so they can take that knowledge and work together to build a world that works for all of us. Senate Bill 138 claims that, uh, and this section of Section 4 of Senate Bill 1 claims that defining racial disparities solely on the legacy of this institution, meaning slavery, is destructive to the unification of our nation. What is destructive is ignoring racial discrimination, pay disparity, the maternal health crisis, student loan debt, the disparate impact of COVID-19, and on and on and on. We are at a critical time in history. And again, to paraphrase Ms. Thomas Walker, we should be a community, not enemies. Question for the body is on passage of Senate Bill 1 as amended by House Committee Substitute 1. House Floor Amendment 6 and House Floor Amendment 7. Is there any further discussion? Seeing now, Mr. Clerk, sound of chimes. We'll now proceed to vote. All those in favor, please signify by voting yeah on a roll call machine. Those opposed, nay. And a roll call machine is open for your voting.
Have all members voted? Would any member like to change or explain their vote? The chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 41 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Bill 1 is problematic for me as someone who served on the SBDM at both of my kids' schools and was involved with hiring a new principal at No Middle School when my son was a student. I definitely do not support removing determination of needs assessments from the SBDM, nor do I support mandating that the JCPS Board of Education not meet more than once every four weeks for the purpose of approving necessary administrative matters. As one of my school board members shared per publicly, no one asked her or, to her knowledge, any board colleagues about limiting meetings or transferring authority to the superintendent. In an effort to communicate effectively with my school board members, I reached out to several, and none of them support Senate Bill 1. I certainly oppose the addition of Senate Bill 138, at least part of Senate Bill 138, into Senate Bill 1. It makes absolutely no sense, and it really is a double down on classroom censorship, erasure, and divisiveness. I really don't see how, again, this aligns with the Commission on Race and Access to Opportunity. So, for example, if we taught a true history of the United States, we would acknowledge that for some, there is not a decline in the family when families were torn apart at the auction block. The chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 42 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Speaker. May I uh, speak on the bill? You may explain your vote, ma'am. I'll explain my vote, thank you. Um, I want to speak on uh, the piece of the bill in uh, 138 and why I voted no. When I was in school in Madison County, elementary, middle, and high school, I did not like going to school. I actually hated going to school. And it wasn't until I got to college that I really enjoyed going to school. And at that time, I realized it was because I was studying and learning about the things that I cared about. And so as I would go back and, and really think about and dig deeper about why that was, when I was in school in Madison County, I didn't learn about people who looked like me, people who were black. Very little. If I did, it was only during Black History Month. And so I stand here explaining my no vote today, saying that if we are going to put any type of regulations or saying what we should and should not be teaching, the thing that we should be saying we should be teaching is making sure that we do teach correct history and more specifically black history to make sure that our students, black students and students of color have a sense of belonging and um, that their voices are, are being heard. I want to let this body know that we should not and we do not get to uh, cherry pick through history. We must learn it all and hopefully grow from all of it. History is a tool to teach us of where we got, got it right and where we sadly got it wrong. We don't get to whitewash parts that we don't like. We don't get to skip over the parts that make us feel uncomfortable. Some change only comes when people are uncomfortable. And young people have the right to learn all of Kentucky history and American history so that they can be equipped to do something different to make our state better. We cannot continue to hide our American history and our Kentucky history under bourbon and bluegrass. Thank you. Gentlemen from Franklin, I saw that you hit your button just as we started the vote, and I know you wanted to speak on the bill, so I'll let you explain your vote to give you a little bit of extra time if you need it there. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Speaker. You know, when I taught history, I would begin the day with saying to my students, if you don't know where you've been, you won't know where you're going. And what I meant by that is that you have to learn 
what has happened in the past so that you can develop ways that it not happen in the future and that you had to build up on what has happened in the past to do that. And so I look at this bill, this portion of the bill, as it's not just about critical race theory, which they're scared or saying that is taught in the elementary and the high school level, but it's really about our students learning, as I said in my previous speech, about them learning and researching and inquiring and developing critical thinking skills so they can develop for themselves and see how things have happened and why they happened, but what was done to try to make things better. We as a nation, we come from all over the world, the only nation that welcomes everybody into this country. And therefore, we need to learn about each other because if we learn about each other, we can build a stronger, a nation of people who believe in the concept that is in the preamble, that we can believe in what we're taught in church every, every Sunday and what we should practice every day of the week, that we are all of God's people and that we should love one another. Even when someone makes you mad, you should still love that individual. That's what this country is built on. The foundation of this country is built on, on re accepting those who are different, but also collaborating with those who are so much have in common, what we all have in common. And even to respect, even if we have differences, to respect one another. This is not about, this is really about the base. It's about politics. And sometimes we have to not do those things. This country has survived because people have stepped forward and have been strong and have been committed towards a United States of America, a united group of people from all over the world who now live in our country and who love our country just as hard as each and every one of us do. This is probably one of the, the toughest bills and one of those bills that I think really is bad for this, not only General Assembly, but for the history of this General Assembly to pass something in this magnitude that we're really, it's about politics. It's about trying to win more seats. Is that the real thing for why we're here? We're trying to do what's right for our people and to give our our people in the education field, the academic freedom to teach what they need to teach for the students so that they can learn and prosper and this, this commonwealth and this country can prosper. So I vote no because that bill does just the opposite. Thank you for allowing me to speak longer, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 35 for explanation to vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm voting no today for the Jefferson County School Board members uh, whose responsibilities we've chipped away at, the responsibilities they were elected to carry out. I'm voting no today for the voters of District 35 and the voters across Jefferson County whose votes for their school board members mean a little bit less now than the votes of every other from every other county in this district. I'm voting no for the parents whose voices will be diminished because of the changes and the chipping away we've done to our site-based decision-making councils. I'm voting no for the teachers and for the teacher shortage and, and so many young teachers looking to leave the profession because they see themselves and their, their professionalism questioned We've chipped away, we've eroded our, our trust in them by saying to them, this is what you must teach. We've put a chill over their classrooms by striking fear, frankly, into what they can and cannot discuss in their classrooms. And today I'm especially voting no for the students, the many students from across Kentucky who have reached out 
on Senate Bill 138 who have begged us not to pass this legislation. Brilliant students from across the Commonwealth who've reached out, who've used their voices to let us know how important academic freedom is to them. So for the students of Kentucky, I vote no on this bill. Thank you. Chair recognizes the lady from Warren 20 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Briefly explain my no vote. Uh, yes, besides my concerns about the teaching of history in an accurate way that lifts everyone up, I'm also really sad that we just took apart something that has worked really well in Warren County, which is the uh, site-based councils. I've uh, heard from a lot of parents who did not want SB1 unamended to pass because they love having that input. This changes that structure considerably, and if this turns out to be a bad change, I hope we will revisit this next year because we talk about parent involvement and needing parents to have a say. This is one very major way that they do it. Thank you. Chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 34 for explanation to vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Excuse me. I voted no on this bill because it does take away some of our parent parental decision making after we just said we were given parents a choice with the last bill. I voted no because children and teachers need to learn what's about in this country and in this world. I think we live in the best country in the world, but we have an ugly, ugly history. The world has an ugly history. The Nazis killed almost 9 million people. Women between 9 and 13 million as witches in the Middle Ages and in the U.S. Native Americans were marched off to live in deserts and their land stolen. The Japanese were interred. You could be raped if you were married. Marital rape was not a crime. You were property of your husband. These are ugly points of history, but they're important so that we don't let them happen again. But the fact that this country spent almost 200 years where white people could own black people is a terrible scar on our nation and on the world. And we need to learn what happened, learn to never let anything like that ever happen again, and I vote no. Chair recognizes the lady from Letcher 94 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm explaining a no vote. I committed early on in this session to vote against Senate Bill 1. That's a promise I'm keeping. This morning they rolled in Senate Bill 138, which feels a little bit like a trap to some of us in rural areas, but I'm glad to see I'm not the only one who took a tough vote to keep a promise. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Jefferson 46 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I voted no today actually for some reasons that have already been mentioned. Um, basically, I don't think it's a good idea to erase certain parts of history just because they are negative and things that we may not be proud of. Um, those things need to be kept around and taught so that we assure that they're not repeated. And when we start making lists of things to teach and that we must teach, and you know, I, I, I breeze through this list and there's a lot of great moments and great documents in there, but as soon as you start making lists, you start leaving some really important ones out. And um, a little bit appalled that the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act is not listed. I think that is a, a huge thing um, for this country, so. Um, Wish I could have made an amendment and try to get that in, but I didn't. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Jefferson 36 for explanation of vote not to exceed two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for over 40 years, JCPS has operated with an inefficient governance structure. 
if JCPS were a private or a, or a public company, they would be the 12th largest in Kentucky, the 12th largest in Kentucky, yet their board has to approve expenditures over $5,000. It's absurd in modern day. This bill, Section 3 specifically, fixes that because it was the Louisville business community who is dependent on the graduates of JCPS who said something needs to change with JCPS. We have brilliant kids and teachers, as the lady from uh, Jefferson 35 said. It's, it's a structural, it's a board problem, and this bill takes care of that. Thank you. I'm proud to vote yes. Chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 43 for explanation to vote not to exceed two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when I served in the United States Air Force, I lived in 11 different countries. And in every country, they wanted to talk about what is it like being black in America? Because all they had was what they saw on TV, what somebody had told them, and now here it was, a real person that was black that could tell them. And I could tell them. I could tell them because I lived it. I could tell them because I thought through it. I could tell them in a way that built a global community. So now we're preparing our students of Kentucky to operate in a global world without the ability to think through our history. We're not preparing them to be the global leaders, and that's where we're going. Global leadership, where people will listen to them because they've thought through their history, they know where they're going, and they're complete with it, and they can create something new. I voted no because every American ought to be able to embrace, understand, and know. We might have done that then, but we're not doing it now, and we're gonna stand for our children to be global leaders. Clerk will take the roll. There being 67 members voting A, 29 members voting A. Senate Bill 1, as amended by House Committee, substitute 1. House Form Number 6 and House Form Number 7 has passed. Gentleman from Boone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would ask the clerk to report House Committee Amendment 1, the Title Amendment. Mr. Clerk, please report. House Committee Amendment 1, the Title Amendment to Senate Bill 1. Gentleman from Boone. Move for adoption. Without objection, so ordered. Gentleman from Boone. Move for clencher. Without objection, so ordered.